just God, it's amazing. Life is just a marathon, so pace Brush pain, that thing's hate me, Damon's. Life ain't gotta be hard, just keep it basic. Welcome back to Fort Meade Declassified. I'm Lorianne Martin and I'm here with Chuck Yang and today we have with us Chief Master Sergeant Jason David, the Command Senior Enlisted Leader for the Defense Media Activity, here to talk to us about more about DMA and Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chief David. Absolutely. It's quite the honor. Well, why don't you um, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, so my name is Jason David. Uh, I do work at uh, the very, very shiny building on Mapes Road, uh, the Defense Media Activity. Uh, the building adjacent to it is also one of ours. It's the Defense Information School. Many, many years ago, when the 32 gate was the main gate, it would be the first thing that you saw as you came on Fort Meade. But there was also a golf course there, too, so I'm sat on two levels. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, uh, a little bit about myself. I've, I've done a couple of tours at Fort Meade. I've spent the preponderance of my 20-plus uh, years in the Air Force overseas. So I, I came into the military as a radio and television broadcaster, and uh, I was a radio disc jockey, kind of like that movie, Good Morning oh. Vietnam. Oh, right. Yeah, and uh, I, I did a lot of that and some combat videography and uh, a lot of regional news storytelling in, in different countries. So it was, it was definitely a cool experience. Uh, to come into the military that way. That's awesome. Well, not even just your tours here on Fort Meade, but you also grew up around Fort Meade, right? That's true. So, uh, you know, I, I came from kind of a, a split home, right? My, my mother lived in Hawaii and my uh, father lived here in the States. And so I would bounce back and forth uh, either for the summer vacation and whatnot. And uh, I actually uh, graduated from Fort Meade High School uh, and I was uh, one of their members of the Junior ROTC program there, which I'm a huge fan of. Oh. Yeah, and uh, funny enough, my sister is actually on base. She works at Cyber Command. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's, uh, and, and our father just lives down the road in, in, in Virginia, so we've been able to manage to keep the family pretty tight. Oh, yeah, sounds nice. like it. Um, do you guys have any military service in your family? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm third generation military, okay. right? And so my grandfather served, uh, my father served 20 plus years as uh, an intelligence guy, right? And uh, because I'm not that intelligent, I went to a different <laughs> I went into broadcasting, which I thought was much more fun. It was all Air Force? All Air Force. Oh, yeah, wow. So it's, uh, it's definitely cool to, to look back and know that your family has contributed to national security, you know, between generations as we went through different wars from uh, Vietnam to the Cold War and to the wars wow. in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proud thing for, you know, the David family to say we were there. Sure. And you said that your um, your mom's from Hawaii. Does she still reside there? She, she does. She okay. does. Uh, so it's it's interesting. Uh, growing up, uh, you know, my, my father being military and my uh, and my and my mother and my father splitting when I was younger, uh, I ended up in a lot of places where I was the only person that looked like me, and uh, mm -hmm. and that didn't really present challenges until I started to understand my my surroundings. And I think I think when you're 14, 15, and 16, that's when you start. Anticipating whether you're getting judged by folks, uh, you know right. whether whether you look cool, whether you act cool, mm -hmm. uh, whether people think you're smart, or uh, if you yourself have enough confidence to operate in a room independently of other people's uh, thoughts and feelings. And so, uh, yes, as as a as an Asian American Pacific Islander, I think uh, being in that minority group, uh, it has with it its own challenges, but there's also some uh, opportunities that can be found in every challenge as well. Absolutely. Do you think that kind of tied into why you? Join the Air Force as well? Yeah, I think so. So, it's a fun, fun story. Um, when my father lived in Japan, uh, I watched the television channel there. It was the American Forces Network. There was mm -hmm. only three channels back then. Uh, if you can imagine, that's a, that's a lot to choose from. <laughs> and I remember seeing a nightly newscast. Uh, it was an AFN broadcaster, and I, I thought to myself, I could do that job. So, I always oh. kept it in the back of my mind as, you know, you know, a very, very lofty 2,500 foot target, you know, long, long term goal if I could ever get there. Uh, when I graduated high school, my ROTC instructor said, you know, we love you, but we want you to be taken care of. So you could go the Army route, but my Army instructor said, you should go Air Force. And so, you know, <laughs> to tickle me to death, right? And I think it's because he knew that the job that I wanted was a specialty job versus just serving, and the Air Force provided that opportunity for me. Yeah, so I auditioned to be a radio and TV broadcaster, and voila, they said, you are so-so at the job, but we'll train you. Oh, wow. They, you have to audition for that? Absolutely. Oh. Hmm. What does that process look like? So you, you just read copy. You read scripts. If you can be understood by uh, the masses 
and, and with your with your dialect, with your speech patterns, if you're confident in what you're trying to say, uh, that makes you an effective communicator, and that's to the benefit of the Department of Defense. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, um, to just tie it back to your service, what has it meant to you to serve all these years? So I, I had kind of an awkward career, right? I, I came in where things were very support-based, very rear support-based, uh, where I was providing uh, avenues for people to get information via the jobs that I had as a, as a radio disc jockey or uh, as, a, as a television anchor. You know, in the early 2000s, I did that as well uh, for, for DOD and, uh, and the Air Force. But then the wars started kicking up. And so I'm, a, uh, I'm not uh, ashamed to tell anyone because I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my service, but uh, unfortunately I was, I was hit with an enemy munition. It broke a lot of bones in my body. So I've had uh, surgery on both my shoulders, my spine, both my hips, and, uh, and I walk with a cane. Right, so uh, you know, receiving the Purple Heart from the Department of Defense was uh, quite the honor for me because uh, it's not something I anticipated or wanted, uh, but that does go along with my life mantra, which is uh, there are opportunities in every challenge. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's a great story. Um, but before we go on, um, what what is Defense Media Activity? What's their mission and vision for? For our audience who doesn't know, like D they know DMA, DMA, but what, what do you guys do? So, so the Department of Defense is a uh, focal point for all communications. Uh, for internal and external is the defense media activity. Uh, we host uh, the ed editorially independent Stars and Stripes newspaper overseas. We control the American Forces Network radio and television service that's also outside of America. And then for everything uh, from Army.mil or Centcom.mil or CyberCommand.mil, all of your websites. So. It's either web, television, social media, uh, or uh, any other means of communication that is representative of the big service. We host that at DMA. It's kind of a cool gig. Yeah, yeah. sounds like it. Kind of broad activity that you guys do for oh, DOD, right? Yeah, we have a uh, even cooler job. So I'm not sure if you watched the A Team when you were growing up. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the A Team is a. I'll go back that far. Good, too. good, good. There's a you know group of five or six expeditionary service members, right? That are that are being called on to do incredible things in the most austere environments. We have our own team. It's called TASA, right? And so it's the Television uh, Audio Activity Support Activity. Sorry, I got that uh, acronym mixed up. We'll we'll send a maintainer in the middle of nowhere. And they'll set up a radio and TV station, or they'll set up a, a, what we call a television in a box uh, for mm -hmm. for the teams out there that have nothing, hmm. right? And so when you when you think about all the people that we touch, uh, being a part of DMA it makes you really proud to be a part of the organization. Sure, sure. So as a leader, um, what do you try to do to improve diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion across the force and build cohesive teams? So education is important, right? Uh, I am self-aware, and I've been made more self-aware as I rose through the Air Force enlisted ranks. Um, when you're a technician, it doesn't mean you can't be a leader, but your scope of responsibility isn't demanding of you, right? It's not saying you must try to influence an organization. You can do it if you, if you, if you have the heart for it. In my case, I was sought out by peers and friends and subordinates that said, uh, at the time, Master Sergeant David, what are you going to do about this situation? Because they were looking mm -hmm. to me as a thought leader, right? And as I made a senior Master Sergeant and then ultimately Chief Master Sergeant, uh, I'll use the killing of George Floyd as a great example of there's a, there's a lesson to be learned in a, in a situation like that that can benefit an organization from ultimately a terrible, you know, terrible crime. Uh, I had a number of leaders that were very nervous because they weren't in a minority status, right? They, they, they uh, or were part of the majority and they yeah. didn't know what to say to the workforce. And so uh, my advice to them was say that. Say that you don't understand exactly what you yeah. might be going through, but I'm here to listen and I'm here to help in any way I can. That's how the conversation starts, right? Yeah. That's how you start building right. small teams that make big teams that make huge organizations succeed. Hmm. That's great. That's great story. So, how do you think that your cultural values as an AAPI member align with the Air Force values? So, uh, you know, this is tongue in cheek, but I'll say, uh, uh, you know, Asian Pacific families are a little more strict when it comes to academics, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, hear that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as am I with my with my daughter as well. And uh, I think it's because we want the next generation of us to succeed. That's all it is. You mm -hmm. know, it's not a bad stereotype. It's it's I think uh, that that sort of uh, responsibility permeates in a lot of other, you know, ethnicities, national origins, and races out there. Um, 
but but for me, I think I think the biggest the biggest takeaway for me uh, for your question is that uh, I would I would say that I have been influenced and I have been sought out by people who would like to be me one day. Hmm. And uh, if you don't mind me giving you a quick story, sure. So I went to Las Vegas as a as a member of the E nine Council, right, for the mm -hmm. Air Force, and we went to a base, went to Nellis Air Force Base uh, in, in Las Vegas, and. We had a, an entire auditorium full, 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 full of people. And one of the young men, he was the Airman First Class, I think he was a, a Filipino descent. He, uh, he came up to my coworker, who's, uh, who was not on the stage, so kind of managing the scene, if you will. Mm -hmm. And he looked at my friend Chris and said, hey, that guy on the stage, he was pointing at me. He said, uh, he's not a chief, is he? Is he a subject matter expert here to brief on something? And my friend Chris <laughs> well, says, um, no, no, he's, he's a chief. And, the, and the, the young man said, that's unbelievable, right? And uh, the story gets better because at the end, uh, the conclusion, uh, my friend Chris comes and tells me why he said it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's because if you were to rewind my face back 20 years, right. we would have been twins, right? So here's an E3 who had just come into the military that looked just like me. Uh, on his desk at work, which he shared with me later, he had a set of Chief Master Sergeant Stripes. I mean, we're talking 1% of 1% of 1% gets has the ability to you know achieve uh, this rank right being in this status right uh, in the year 2023 mm -hmm. I, I joke in some of the speeches I give during this month that uh, out of the Air Force's 330,000 there's about 1,800 chiefs right and wow. there's 879 that are minorities and out of that mm -hmm. 0.5 are of Asian Pacific descent so I have better chances of winning the lottery <laughs> than ever being a guest speaker for someone so uh, this young man that, uh, that 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 came to me afterwards told me, he said, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have met you because I, now I know it's real. Now I know mm. I can do it, right? And that's so, amazing. Wow. So I gave him a set of my straps. I cried a little, you know, because yeah, I'm, I'm an old sure. man and, you know, that stuff makes you emotional. But sure. it's it's great to not necessarily shatter a glass ceiling, but just remove the ceiling. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. What a great story. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Of course. Um, how has DMA been honoring not just to this one, but uh, AAPI, HM? Previously, so uh, it, it's it, it's interesting you say that the the Department of Defense gives us our marching orders, and and underneath the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, there is a public affairs um, component, mm -hmm. and so the National Observance Months that are signed by the President always filter right down to us. So we're the mecca of almost every cultural observance theme that you can have on any government website, any Facebook site, any Twitter account. Uh, I don't know if we're on Snapchat yet, right? <laughs> but but any platform uh, that we can go out to promote uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, DMA is right behind it because we're we're usually the source that everyone pulls from. Right. Uh, I also didn't talk about the Defense Visual Information uh, Distribution System or DIVIDS. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people know that if they're in the PA circles, but if you're not, that's right. the government's repository for video everywhere mm -hmm. from every base, from every service member that's ever produced something, and that's where the news channels get their footage from. Right, and so uh, we have a lot of folks overseas that, as a network, because we have 26, you know, radio and television stations overseas, about a 1,500 uh, strong workforce. All these people are gathering and creating content, dropping it to places like Divots, mm -hmm. and then maybe Fox 45 here in Baltimore picks it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a new and different way to transfer information. Something mm -hmm. that we never had before. It's like a hive mind. You know what I mean? It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's helpful. I use it all the time. Excellent. So. Um, well, can you tell us more about the role that DMA fits into here at Fort Meade? Sure, sure. So as, as, a, as a respectful tenant unit, right, uh, we're, we're always uh, doing our best to lead the charge for, you know, Army and Air Force and Navy and Marine promotions. So anything that happens at Club Meade, we have a slew of volunteers that uh, come from DMA to show support, right? We, we all know that we're like, we're renters, basically. <laughs> all the tenant <laughs> units are renters. And the garrison is the one that's actually in charge. And so when there's a base cleanup, we're out there cutting grass or or picking up trash with the best of them, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're always uh, supportive of team players because we know uh, that without the support from the garrison, we would not be able to succeed. So it's, it's very helpful that the relationship between uh, our boss and your guys' boss is very strong. And it has been yeah. for, for many tours over the course of many different commanders. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like DMA plays a great role here on Fort Meade. And you said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from the garrison PAO office, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> And DIMFOS doesn't just take Air Force, it takes Army, Navy, 
All, all services. Correct. So, so all the D agencies, uh, including us, so DMA, uh, is, is very similar to uh, the Defense Health Agency, uh, Defense uh, Intelligence Agency, um, uh, Defense Information Systems uh, Agency, so DISA, DLA, DIA, DMA. Uh, all of us are, are joint flavored. So if you ever were to come to one of our barbecues in the back of the building, you know, the sailor would be cooking, the army would be eating, the marine would be throwing the football, and the army guy would be catching it, right? So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's definitely cool to work in, in the joint environment. Uh, the longest running joke, though, we did a poll, and we tried to find uh, what the number of bodies on Fort Meade were. There's actually more airmen on Fort Meade by a little bit than there are soldiers. Oh, right? yeah. So we used yeah. to joke we and call it... We all know that. We used to <laughs> joke and call it Fort Meade Air Force Base until we got you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we were known as a purple organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fort Meade is definitely a wonderful place to work. Uh, not necessarily because of the uh, the location, you know, being right next to Baltimore, Washington, the airport, uh, but because all the important people that are in, you know, the big government, they're all here. Mm -hmm. And and how great is that for you know joint interoperability? And I hate mm -hmm. that word, but I I, lo I love it at the same time. <laughs> okay. Well, is there anything else you want to share with our audience? So uh, I I have a like a closing comment, right? Okay. So in, in this month and all others, right? When you're looking at uh, cultural uh, observances, and you're looking at uh, months that uh, are, are are you know labeled as thematic, right? Mm -hmm. By by the head shed, uh, the president's office. It's not just another day. So the people that are affected, they feel it, right? So if you are um, somewhat oblivious uh, to to the to the awareness of the months and the reasons for them, I just encourage you just just read up on it, right? Uh, that way, if it uh, if it, if it affects your coworkers. Um, that you have a little more understanding. I'll use last uh, last year's uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month uh, gathering at Club Mead, for example. That place was absolutely packed, and there were people from all all different uh, you know parts of life and and uh, different backgrounds. And it was amazing to see the amount of purple support from mm -hmm. the different services, mm -hmm. as well as difference in cultural support. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, there are people from all over the place that came, and so uh, I, I do treasure Fort Mead because that that sort of embedded team spirit lives here. And it's amazing. And once again, last last week's event uh, at Club Me also great turnout sure. with uh, Chaplain Kim speaking on the observance. Uh, well, Chief David, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, we appreciate your uh, taking time to come out here and talk to us today and share your uh, special moments. And uh, we hope to uh, hear more about DMA and. Uh, <laughs> more greater luck to you in the future. Absolutely. Hope to do this again with you guys sometime in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at Fort Meade Declassified. We'll see you next time. Hold up. I got a new myth. Oh, I just got it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Life is just a marathon. So basic.